New Year's. What is it? Two days. Resolutions will be made. Promises. Regrets from the last year's failures. If you're that kind of person that sets yourself up for disappointments, there's enough to look at this world and say, I want to accomplish this to only come to find out life had a different plan. God had a different plan. But there's a certain thing that it's sure, and it's His Word, that we can find out that His promises are true and that He who begun the good thing in us will complete the good thing in us into the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. What I want to talk to you about this morning is just something I've learned this coming year, this last year. And what I'm sure I'm going to keep on learning. But it's a time also of a reflection that you can look at the past and say, how did I do in the things that God kind of puts a little spotlight on your life? Keeping the main thing the main thing. So this morning, as we turn to this area of Scripture, this is Jesus in John right here around chapter 7, chapter 6. He's about, uh, about six months to the cross. He's on his way to the cross. He's going to fulfill the last three feasts in Jerusalem. Then he goes back up north uh, in between. The other Gospels record all the time that he's up in Galilee. They they record this. And John records when he's down uh, fulfilling just uh, just the feasts, the last three feasts. Well, this is the first of the feasts, and it's known as the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. And in this feast, it's a fascinating feast. They're wondering if he's going to show up because he's already turned over some tables. He's also already had this idea that he's radical and, and, and they are seeking to kill him, start plotting how they would put him to death. So the, the murmuring that's happening is, well, will Jesus show up? Now this feast is a seven day long feast and it's, this feast is the happiest time. This, this is the time like it's the party party of the feast. This is, this is when everybody would come into town, they would have a torch with them or they were given a torch. And at the beginning of the, the feast, they were to take these little tents and set up all inside the temple area. And it was to remind them of their traveling in the wilderness, how they were pilgrims on a journey, strangers in a strange land. They would set up their tents, their family. And what they were to do is build a, a, dig a trench around their tent. And I'll explain why they would do that in a moment. And they would get these torches and they would light these torches at night, which represented God taking care of them at night with the pillar of fire. And during the day at the beginning of this feast, the priest would come out with this big gold pitcher and he would stand up in front of everyone and he would take this gold pitcher and pour out water. And everybody would remember how that rock followed them in the wilderness, providing water for them. And they would go down to the Kid Run Valley and they would get pitchers. And all day long, they would pour water around in that trench around their little tent, if you would, with an open ceiling. The tents were constructed open ceiling. And what's fascinating about how this feast kicked off is there was well-trained priests. This was their job. They had 70-foot uh, poles, uh, candlesticks, that at each corner, 70 foot high with four torches on top, and the priest would climb up on the wall 70 feet from the top wall. They would take a ladder, climb all the way up, light these torches, and they were trained for this. this they were trained for this, and they would do backflips off the ladder onto the wall and start doing like circus flips. Like, like you were in the circus and everybody start lighting their torches. Music would start playing. Water would start being poured out. People were uh, enjoying themselves. The families were gathering. I mean, it was a celebration of celebrations. Just God had provided for us and we're here. We're safe. He's faithful to his people. And it was an incredible celebration. And then at night, all of a sudden the torches would go down. 
And every family was to take their, the, the, the father was to take the family into the tent and they would lay on the ground inside their tent and they would look up and the father would tell the story of God providing through the wilderness and how he always took care of them. And they did this for six days. And on the seventh day, what was different is as the priest would come up in front of everyone, the, the, the same thing, but something strange would happen. He'd take the pitcher of water and he would stand out to kick off the seventh day and he would pour and there was no water. And a celebration turned into complete silence. And the father would take the children, the mother, into the tent and they would pray for the Messiah to come. And on the seventh day, they would just lay there looking and talk about the faithfulness of God and how God is going to still be faithful to send the Messiah. How incredible is that? Now, pick up with me here at verse 37 of John chapter 7. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, Is anyone thirsty? Let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out from his heart will flow rivers of living water. Picture, Lord, send the Messiah. Lord, send the Messiah. You've been faithful 38 years in the wilderness. You see, they hung around the mountain uh, two years before they went into their 40. But you've been faithful. Now we need the Messiah. The water's run out. You see, in the wilderness, there was a time that all of a sudden the rocks stopped giving the water. And they knew they were at the end of their journey. And now, Lord, we still need water. But Jesus says something quite interesting. He says, as Scripture has said. As Scripture has said, I want to just read this to you. It's 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 a it's a cool area. I will thirst and not be afraid, for Yahweh, the Lord, is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. You, you see, God has become my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. Therefore, the Isaiah writes, therefore we for now on will draw water with joy from the wells of our salvation. Speaking of anyone who is thirsty, come drink of me. And in that day you will say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his deeds among the people, Make mention of his name and exalt him. Sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is how in all the earth I will now cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. What a celebration. What a cool thing that Jesus says, anybody thirsty? Anybody have need? It's not in the party. It's not in the remembering. It's not even in the past of my great faithfulness. It's in drinking of me. And from that moment on, you will shout for joy. You know, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have that that satisfies your soul like nothing else can. And it's drinking of Jesus. Peter, he said to Peter, after all of Peter's ministry and after all of Peter's blundering, he calls Peter back and he says, Peter, you know this, you know the area. You can turn there if you would like to John chapter 21, but I'm only going to be there short for a moment. In verse 15 of John 21, 15, 
But yeah, once you turn there, it's a great, great area to really know. This living water. We got to have the living water. I just got news, a little side side note that uh, a missionary that I got I got a call this morning that uh, went out and seventy some years old and she became di- dehydrated out in the ministry field and uh, she passed away. And I just got that call, but you know the kind of cool thing she she uh, she was following her calling. And she sold everything, got moved everything, and went on out. And she was only over there a couple months and, and passed away. But, you know, they said it has to do something with the lack of water. And it just dawned on me, you know, we, we need this living water. But what a cool thing. Just on a little side note, she, she, she was right where she needed to be to meet the Lord. And how, how, how of a cool thing. So there's actually rejoicing. And it, here's Peter. He's been off. He got off course. He started looking at circumstances around him, and, and he wasn't really understanding what Jesus was saying to him throughout the whole time. He, he wasn't just sitting still and taking in what the Lord was wanting to do inside his life. He, he had his own agenda. He had his own ideas. And when Jesus calls him back to himself, when he came to that place of completely going, man, I, 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 I'm a wreck. Jesus comes to him, he says, Simon, Simon. He, now, now, what's interesting is look at verse... Uh, now, this is the third time that Jesus showed up to his disciples after he had raised from the dead in verse 15 uh, of, of chapter 21. Now, when they had eaten breakfast... Now, the original language was, as he broke bread. And if you're ever a Bible student, just, just do a little study in every time that the Lord broke bread with his disciples. Every time he was breaking bread, he was revealing himself to them. It was the guys on the road to Emmaus as their eyes were opened as he broke the bread. Uh, It's our communion. Do this in remembrance of me, and we break the bread. This this is what it's about. It's about eating the Lord. And, And that is so huge in a busy society, in a busy church. It's about eating the Lord in a busy life. He says to Simon, Simon, son of Jodah, do you love me more than these? And many commentaries have said, is it the fish he's talking about or just life in general? And when he has said this, he says, Lord, you know I love you. He then says, feed my sheep. If you love me, you're going to give them living water. If you love me, you're going to feed my people. Then he says, Simon, do you do you?" Son of Jonah, do you love me? And we know that he says in verse 16, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says then, tend my sheep. Now this feeding is the word of God, the living water. Then he says, now tend, and this tend is, now love them. Love them. Make make sure you're not force feeding them. Now just love them. So love and feed, love and feed. And then he says again, then, 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 then Simon, do you love me? And, and, and at this point, he's actually getting upset. He's going, Lord, you know I love you with what I can do. With all I got, that my ability right now is, is at least I'm giving as much as I possibly can in love to you. He says, good enough, then feed him. Feed him, love him. There was something that has just resurfaced again and again and again in my heart. When I started uh, ministry, there was something that Chuck Smith would say to us all the time. Make sure your people are the best fed and loved sheep in the county. And that's it. And he would teach us and he would say, listen, it's not about the, it's not about the worship. It's not about, it's not, it, watch, it's about the worship. It's not about the techno of it. It's not about, you know, do we, do we set up the right things? Do we have everything? I was getting into so often, I pulled off church. But was I loving the people? Was I feeding the people? And what, was I feeding the people what they needed for nourishment? Or was I feeding the people what I needed to see the church do? And there was a big difference between those things, even when we 
walk with one another. We can feed people to get our own agenda done. We can feed to direct them. We, bec- we can become managers of ministry and miss the love for people. But one, we know that I, I went to a church, and as I took over an existing church, we had all kinds of committees when I came in. We had all kinds of uh, 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 backbiting. We had all kinds of very religious church. Everybody had their job, Everybody and nobody crossed each other. That's my thing. You stay out of my thing and don't touch that thing. And I mean, it was all this kind of weird kind of playing of church and worship would start and I'd I'd walk in. I remember so many times somebody, hey, come here. I want to talk to you. And they want to talk to me during worship. I go, no, no, no. Listen, we're here to the Lord's meeting us. I had one guy, he was a leader and he says, man, you take this stuff serious. No, no, no. The Lord's meeting us. This is why we're here. We get to be fed not only from the pastor and not only from one another, but we get to get fed by the Lord. Remember, anybody thirsty, come to me and drink. So this is all we're doing is, is what we do is we gather together. We're out there. We go, hey, come on in. Worship started. Come on in. You know, it's about getting fed by the Lord and letting the Lord love on you. And in return, we then love him back. And then here's the cool thing. Love accomplishes it all. I mean, think about it at a moment. Would you rather have your cupboard clean or your husband loving you? You ought to take love anytime. Well, one of you went, wait, how bad is your closet? <laughs> love. And Jesus says, you'll know my disciples by their love one for another. Peter, do you love me? Then love my people like... I love them, is what he's really saying to them. And here, here's kind of the, the, the next little step is John 5 says this. Oh, turn, turn with me to John 5. Thirty nine. Then I'll start at verse 37. He's talking to the Pharisees that say they know the Lord. Now the Pharisees, let me get your attention real quick. They were interesting. The, the, the Pharisees were like the, uh, the law keepers. They were like the policemen. So they were the ones that uh, um, made sure that you did the word of God the right way, according to their interpretation. So if you notice any time that they're trying to trip up Jesus, they got the Pharisees there. And when the scribes would show up, it's interesting, the scribes were the ones who would dictate down uh, to try to catch him in saying something. And then, then the Pharisees could in, enforce it. So pretend you have the investigator there, the Sadducee, then you have the Pharisees there, and they're there to just, uh, just trip them up so that they can bring them to the cross, accuse them before Pilate and Herod and, you know, really discard who he is. And this is who he's talking of. But, but here's what's interesting. There were individuals that were always depicting the word. Okay. Got to remember this. When Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were always priding themselves that they were in the Bible, in the word. Knew it better than anybody else. But what were they void of? Love. So it turned into legalism, turned into evaluation, turned into criticisms, turned into a place that became a club other than a loving hospital where people's actual needs are being met. And and I'll tell you what, a loving body, just, just, uh, there's nothing greater. It's, It's more attractive than anything you can ever imagine. Uh, we, we, so he, he says to them here, uh, verse 37, The Father himself who sent me has testified to me, you neither hear his voice at any time nor has seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding you. What? Could you imagine the insult this is? This is their professional worders. I mean, they're professional guys. This is the, 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 this is the college professor. What, what do you mean? He says, you don't have the word abiding you because 
whom he sent, you do not believe. Here's the key of not loving people is you don't believe it works. When we go to every other aspect to reach a community outside of love, we don't believe love works. We don't believe Jesus can do what Jesus can do. When we want to do, get something accomplished in our home and we, and we try to move it outside of love, we don't think Jesus can do what Jesus can do. And, and, and God so loved the world. It's everything from love. It's Jesus plus nothing. And all we have as Christians is just to give Jesus away, this incredible love relationship that we have, and nobody can argue with that. He says, you don't even have the word because you've missed the person of the word. And uh, he says, you search, look at verse 39, it's, it's fantastic. You search scripture for in them you think you have eternal life. These are they that testify of me. He said, you're reading the scripture because you're going, yeah, I'm saved. Hmm? I got eternal life because I'm doing. You ever been there? Say a show of hands. Doing is probably one of the biggest deceptions that we're okay with God. Then I park all the cars. I did my service. I, 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 I set up all the, I, I did my service. I brought in the, Hey, guys, I know how exhausting it is to set up a church service. Believe me, done it too many years. And you can literally get to the place you go, yeah, I serve the Lord. I know, but did you, did you meet the Lord? Did, did you have that loving interaction that you left here today and you were full? Because you drank of him and you just, just, oh, I just love his presence. I love his presence. That's why we do church. That's why we get together. Because we love his presence. And we love to love each other. Because there's nothing more that any of us need is to listen. We're not searching scripture to find the key. We found the key. He's woven in every word in the scripture. They testify of me. Oh, did I get hammered last year? I'm teaching. I'm, I'm putting all this puzzle together and stuff. And the Lord says, hey, that's really clever. That's pretty good. That, that's, where am I? Well, you're in there. Peel back all these incredible deep truths. Were they walking away with Jesus? Just going, I got such a good God. Or was I giving them a bunch of stuff they had to do this year, this week, this, this you know, to make them right before God, to make their life right? It, it's like, listen, if you love somebody, you're going to be right. You get out of love. Do you realize Revelation 2, the very first act of the church is they left their first love? And he says, I know everything you're doing. You got really, really busy, and your busyness pulled you away from me. My presence. It ever ever happened in marriage? Ever happened with children? Why in the world wouldn't it happen with our relationship with God? It just it just does. And he says, "Listen, you study, but it all speaks of me." And guys, this is so encouraging for when we're sharing Scripture. Is listen, find Jesus right in the midst of it. He's there. It speaks of Him. And if I have Jesus clothing me, guess who's going to get the work done? It's going to be Jesus, whatever it is. And then it's kind of a cool thing is I, I look and I say, well, what is Jesus about? Turn with me to Luke. It's interesting. Luke chapter 4. Well, I do want to do the deeds of Jesus. I do want to, you know, represent him correctly. And absolutely, once you're in love with him, you just, Lord, what do you want? I mean, that's an automatic. This is not anti-service, you know. Everybody goes, oh, good, no more trailer. No, 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 nobody's saying that. All right, believe me, nobody's saying that. What we're saying is the right heart. The right heart in the whole thing is, is literally, that man, you know what, I just love the Lord today in service. I, I love the Lord today in, 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 in loving and, and sitting somebody or doing sound. It was all about loving the Lord. And my wife has been saying this to our worship team, there's, She'd been whispering it to me, 
and I've been whispering it to the worship team, is um, show worship. And you know what? It's a wonderful thing. Show worship. I have an assistant pastor. His old pastor used to say to him, hey, are you happy today? I mean, you're full of joy. And he goes, yeah. He goes, what? let your face know it. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, in all honesty, and, and you could look at him, you go, I don't know if he's happy. You know, I don't know if he's, yeah. Hey, if you're worshiping, worship. Go ahead and show it. And you, you guys, oh, fantastic worship. I love this worship team. I really do. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, verse 18 of chapter 4 of Luke. This is how Jesus started his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. There isn't one single thing in this listing that isn't hinged out of love. Did, did you catch it? Go and make disciples right here. Heal them. Feed them. Tend to them. Invest in them. In their heart. Get them out of oppression. It's the stinkies of ministry. It's weeping with somebody that weeps. Laughing with somebody who laughs. It's daring enough to simply just go, man, I've been there. But I know somebody who can be with you in the midst of where you're at. And I'll never leave you. Jesus, this is how he started his ministry, and I don't think he's changed. But these characteristics are not necessarily characteristics that are in the forefront of my mind. To... Preach the gospel, the good news. I looked up good news on, on the World Wide Web. Remember, we, you used to have to type that in, www, what, you know. And I found uh, Joel Olstein. I found uh, different TV shows that were uplifting good news. I found Fox News, Fair and Balanced. And as I went through, I couldn't find anybody that referenced gospel. Isn't that amazing? But that's what the world's looking at is, hey, hey, good news is what's going on around me. And if I can control what's going around me in society, stock market, my 401k or lack of, or if I can control my work and I can control other things, then I can live in this incredible good news. But that's not for Christians. That's for the world that doesn't have the real good news. The real good news is Jesus Christ crucified, my sins are forgiven. That, 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 that's it. I, I just whispered to a guy, we, we've been driving around and looking at different vehicles and stuff, and the guy said to me, he, he said, uh, car salesman, he says, you deserve this. A nice Porsche. I think he's right. <laughs> it wasn't a portion. I, I whispered to him, I said, buddy, listen, I deserve hell. That's it. That's what I've earned. I haven't earned anything beyond that. That's the gospel. The good news that I'm loved. Do, do you understand something? This is how crazy this is. My name's Jim Coy, and I'm loved by God. Do you know how crazy that is? If you knew who I am, where I've been, you know how crazy that is? Now put your name there. Me and my wife constantly pinch each other. and We go, you know, this is Jim and Teresa doing this stuff, right? That God would dare enough to entrust somebody, one person, one person into my life that I could share the love of Jesus with, that he would trust me that much is mind-boggling to me. One person. Do you know if you're touching and loving one person, you're probably doing more than most society will do for somebody else. But that's that love. 
And do you know if you have somebody inside your life that is so loving to you, do you know automatically what you do? You've got to meet this person. He is so loving. Can you imagine if you had the church and what you guys are, you know, and you just keep on loving each other. You know what spreads out. It, it, it doesn't matter what your, what, what your church looks like, what the structure looks like, what they're doing or what they're not doing and who this person is or that ministry out there. Listen, it has nothing to do with what God's doing here. If I'm going to love, you watch how many people just sit there and just go, man, I was so loved today. But you know what has to happen is we have to get off ourselves. Jesus, he didn't say the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because uh, I teach some of the best messages around. If they would just hear it. You know, one of his greatest messages he ever taught was he said, unless you eat of me and drink of me, you have no part of me. And all of them left him. And he looked at his disciples, John 666. It's interesting that it's 666. And he says, do you want to go? And they said, where will we go? We have come to know that you have eternal life. The gospel. you got the good news. And that good news has transformed this world for everybody who believes. And that's what we want to also accomplish. Luke 4. What happened to me is, turn with me really quick to Luke chapter 10. And we'll close here. Luke chapter 10, we'll pick up at verse 40. Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him, Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not even care? Let me get your attention. You ever been there? Lord, you don't even think about me. I know I'm the last. Are you leaning on my name when you're looking down from heaven and, and you can't see me? Lord, do you not even care that my sister has left me all alone, left me to serve alone, has left me, I'm exhausted, I'm doing this all myself. Well, okay, I'm adding a little bit there. Therefore, Tell her to help me. You ever feel like you're carrying the burden all by yourself? Can I suggest you need to get back to the last day of the feast to see his faithfulness and him standing there and saying, anybody thirsty, come and drink of me. I suggest that maybe we get too far off too quickly. And we can do that in much serving. Jesus is here. And now automatically with a good heart. Martha's doing this with a good heart. She's, she's serving. The Lord is here. Let's serve. Let's serve. Let's serve. And Jesus said to him, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. Is that you? Worry. Trouble. The day is full of it. The thing we have so neat as Christians is we get to have that sanctuary in the midst of the day. And he says, Martha, Martha, you are worried about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chose that good part which will not be taken away from her. You see, what Mary was doing was sitting at the feet of Jesus when Jesus was in the house. And Martha was getting everything ready and she was getting everything because guests were coming and she was getting every. I mean, there was a, an event going to take place and I get it and it's a good heart, but she's missing Jesus in the midst of it. Oh my goodness, I smiled so much this Christmas. At Melanie and Ryan's house and the kids are opening up these presents. Oh my goodness. What, what, and, and I sat there and I just smiled. And for some of the fewer times, I just took it in and my, 
my deal has been lately, just take it in, take it in. We pull off a church service. We're in the presence of God. We, we have a Bible study. We take in the Lord, sit at his feet, drink of him, worship him. You know, you, you know, take all that you have and pour it on his feet and everything you're not. And this Christmas, as I just sat at Melanie Ryan's house and I'm watching the kids, I, I, I literally kept going, you're smiling too much. You're just smiling too much. Just taking it in. Look at their faces and how much they were into each other's gift. And that was what was so amazing. All of them would stop as one child would just open up another gift. and they go, what you get? What you get? And they were so into what somebody else was getting. And I'm watching this going, oh, Lord, it's working. I was telling Melanie, I was so proud, so proud. It, it takes a labor of love to keep on doing this in your children. At some point, you think they're insane. The next minute, you get these glimpses that they're not. They go, oh, God is so faithful. It's working, it's working, it's working. I want to tell you something. I've seen the church that I'm pastoring in the last two years uh, completely change from what it was. We decided what we're going to do is love. And we'll let some things fall apart. And we'll let some things that, you know, just, oh, do you see how undone that is? And let's just love them. Let's just love them. And we got all kinds of resistance. And we would say that we probably turned over the church about 80%. And those that, you know, wanted to stay in this bickering and, 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 and biting, and, and they, they realize there's no place here for that. Because love covers a multitude of sins. And we had those that all of a sudden started getting concerned, what's, what's happening, what's happening? Hold on. Lord's developing a church. Lord, this is his dwelling place. And what I had to do is, I'm the new guy coming in. And now the church is shrinking. Oh, this is personal. No, this is his church. And, and, and you know, let's, let's see what the Lord's doing here. And I knew his call. I knew what he does. I know his character, and I know mine. And mine is, you know, let's get this all into managing and, and, and put it all together. That, that's dirty, and this is clean. You know, and, and let's do all that. And I, I probably drove Andrew, I need to apologize. I drove Andrew nuts when I was here in many cases. Is that, is that base just a little bit too? <laughs> Love. And been able to see the church just, there's something interesting and you don't need to turn there. Matthew, Matthew 9. Jesus looked at a group of people and it says, and he was moved with compassion because he saw them as sheep without a pastor. Wow. And that was an area of scripture that rocked me. They needed somebody that would be like Jesus. They would simply just say, I'll love you right where you're at. And some of the greatest testimonies of Calvary Chapel was under the, the leadership of a Chuck Smith that people would look and say, does he know what he's doing? As he would take individuals that nobody else would love, and he would love them. And you'd take other individuals that nobody would give a chance, and you'd say, I'll trust them to the Lord. I'm one of them. And you know, it's a neat thing to see the fruit of love. Because well-loved sheep produce fruit. Just can't help it. You see, when there's bickering and fighting and not saying there is here, what's your love like? At, love life like at home? doesn't work. But when there's unity, not at any cost, but when Christ is the number one, Jesus plus nothing, everything fits together. Then we end up with individuals go to me and, you know, I just do this because I just love Jesus. I just love him. I'll sell everything. I'll move everything. I'll do whatever because my Jesus called me. Isn't that a cool place to be?